Thank you. Good morning. I'm the third choice speaker for this panel. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I hope I can live up to your low expectations. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of what I was asked to do, and then I'm going to do some other things, too. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I think part of the reason that Chaz may have suggested me is that I wrote a book on uh, how the National Security Council works, uh, and I defined it broadly as all the agencies of the U.S. government that work in the formation of foreign policy. Uh, and if you want some advice, all of you are graduate students, and you know some of you may write books, uh, my advice is write a book on a subject that no one else has written a book. You instantly become the leading scholar in the area. <laughs> Uh, that that is in part what happened in this case, um, uh, and I'm actually in the middle of writing the follow-up book to that, looking at foreign policy formation in the Bush years and in the Obama years. Uh, so I've been a bit immersed in this. Now I, I, I quickly looked at the materials here. It looks like all of you are attending graduate programs someplace in the United States, looking at some of these things. Um, and if you study any foreign policy at all, you will find that. Uh, you know, the first thing they talk about um, in classes is process because, you know, in, in international relations professionals love to talk about process and they'll say, well, you've got to understand, you know, in the foreign policy, you know, there are working level committees and there are, they all have different names. Uh, assistant secretaries are in this. Deputy assistant secretaries are in the working level. But they don't tell you in Washington working level is an insult. Uh, you know, most places in the world where you say working, that, that actually implies you're doing something. But in Washington, you want to be at the policy level, not the working level. Um, and that's the deputies level, so that's undersecretaries and deputy secretaries getting together. And they're really being asked to pull together the issues so that the principals, cabinet secretaries, can think about them uh, and make uh, decisions. That is in administrations where the president actually is interested in the principal's point of view. In some administrations, the decision-making apparatus actually constricts even more closely around the president and his nearest advisors. Um, and uh, those decisions then you know, manifest themselves in other ways uh, or they get made in other ways. In this administration, for example, it's a very small group around the president that really influences foreign policy most directly. Um, and um, uh, in that uh, group, you, you, you have the closest political advisors to the president as well as foreign policy advisors. They meet each morning. There's a meeting uh, with the national security advisor, the deputy national security advisor, the national security advisor, the vice president, typically the vice president, uh, uh, sometimes the, the, also the national, deputy national security advisor for uh, counterterrorism. Uh, and it's that small group that sometimes has some political people in it in this administration that often the biggest foreign policy questions are addressed. Tom Donlan, the national security advisor, described it to me as the three-year conversation. In other words, this happens every day. They get together. They talk about the issues. Uh, and, in fact, the other elements of this apparatus are less involved. Um, of course, you know, if, if you're talking to your IR professors, they will then, after they've talked about process, they will then uh, elevate themselves and you in the discussion of policy uh, because, you know, they, they like to think of America as having policies uh, because during the Cold War we had a policy of containment of the Soviet Union, uh, and because the Cold War went on for a long time, that was kind of enshrined, um, and there was this sense that policy was what drove the foreign policy apparatus. It's, after all, in the name, foreign policy. Um, uh, the bad news uh, is that it almost never is. Uh, I worked in the United States government. I had a job title that had policy in the title. People would come to me and say, we'd like to make policy, and I would tell them, I'm sorry, but that just doesn't happen. We tend to react to news cycles. Uh, we tend to react to events that are happening um, outside in the world. Uh, there are very, very few areas where there is real coherent policy the way you would think of it. 
In other words, where you would say, uh, well, let's get together in a room. China is a very important country. Let's talk about the United States' relationship with China. We need a little bit of containment. We need a little bit of engagement. We need a little bit of counterbalancing. Let's 30% uh, of it, you know, and then we'll have a policy, and then we'll go and do that. Uh, that, that kind of recipe making doesn't happen in the United States government. Um, there is no policy towards China. There are some policy impulses, um, in economic engagement. Um, we don't like the cyber stuff so much, so we're going to say that's central to the U.S. foreign policy agenda with China. And it is, because, you know, Tom Donlan was just talking to the leadership over there last week, and he said, cyber is central. This will be one of the most important issues that the president will discuss next week when the president meets with uh, Premier Xi in China and in, in uh, California, and they're going to say cyber will be central. What does that mean? You know, what is our policy? Do we actually have a policy beyond we don't like this stuff so much, don't do it anymore? Um, the answer is no, because we, cause we don't really have it. You know, what are we going to do? You know, get into a trade war, you know, launch an attack. We, we haven't figured it out yet. So most of the time, there's kind of a predisposition. You know, there's an inclination. We don't like this. We're for that. You know, we don't like human rights abuses. But frankly, we, we like trade more than we don't like human rights abuses. So... Uh, we're going to keep the trade going, and we're going to, you know, you know, admonish, you know, you privately and sophisticated administrations, publicly and unsophisticated administrations, and you know, it's 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 more like that, you know. But of course, no one's going to go and get a graduate degree in international relations someplace and be told that what you're studying actually doesn't happen. So, um, uh, so, you know, so that's a. You know, that's, a, that's an, another component of this. I think another component of it, though, you know, that almost never gets discussed is people and the role that people play in this. And, of course, at the end of the day, people make policy and the relationships between people become critical. If the president of the United States is, you know, George W. Bush and he, like, gets along with people and he's got, you know, he's very chummy and he feels he's kind of a corporate uh, relationship with, you know, cabinet members as part of a board, then that gets you a certain kind of functioning in the administration, uh, and 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 you can defer, and, and you know, it was really pivotal. If you take U.S.-China relations, for example, during the Bush administration, particularly second term of the Bush administration, the president was perfectly happy to lead Hank Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury, essentially at the lead of U.S.-China policy, right? In this administration, where the president really doesn't engage his cabinet very much. Uh, he holds a few issues very close to the White House. Um, China policy is being driven more out of the National Security Council than it has been at uh, probably any time uh, in U.S. history. Uh, state and Treasury have their strategic and economic dialogue, which basically involves a lot of squabbling between state and Treasury. You know, this is like, you know, letting, you know, two children who don't get along very well, um, you know, you know, putting them jointly in charge of something and both sides wanting, you know, their issues to be the most important issues. Um, uh, but, but the real heavy lifting is getting done in the White House. And so who the people are matter. In fact, you've probably heard a lot about the pivot to Asia uh, although some people might refer to it as the strategic rebalancing. And see, this is code. And if you're like a Washington insider, and now that you're here, I will make you all Washington insiders by explaining this to you. Um, if somebody says the pivot to Asia, that means they were probably a Hillary Clinton supporter because that was the way the State Department started talking about it. When the White House saw that it was gaining traction, they said, let's call it a strategic rebalancing. And so if the person you're talking to calls it a strategic rebalancing, they're reading White House talking points as opposed to State Department talking points. Um, but, of course, one of the reasons this all happened was when Hillary Clinton became the Secretary of State, um, you know, they sort of cut a deal. And it was a very explicit deal. The, the White House said, you get to appoint the people in the building, we will appoint the ambassadors. 
And lo and behold, just because the way Washington works, lots of ambassadors were people who gave money to the president's campaign. Um, and this happens all the time, and people pull their hair out, and they say this is a terrible thing. But it happens all the time. Lots of ambassadors get their jobs either because they gave money or they did some political favor for president. The White House appointed those. Hillary Clinton appointed the people in the building for the most part. And part of the deal was that the White House was going to take the lead on certain issues, and others would be left to the State Department. So the White House said, we're going to, we got to handle Iraq. That's really important. We're going to handle Afghanistan. You'll do some of the civil society stuff within Afghanistan, but in terms of the big, heavy policy making, the policy initiatives are going to happen within the White House. Um, Arab-Israeli peace talk, you know, Israel, the Palestinians, that's kind of a big deal. That's going to handle in the White House. And so you sort of had this checklist, and, and, and Secretary Clinton, because she, you know, was a principal and she had, you know, wanted to have her own initiative, said, well, where do I look? And Asia was kind of open. And the strategic rebalancing became, you know, part of the fact that she also had an activist assistant secretary who said, you know, what about Southeast Asia? Why don't we go and develop relationships there? You know, we don't have a dialogue with Laos. We don't have a dialogue within ASEAN. Let's get involved more in those issues. Let's get involved more in India. All of these things counterbalance the rising weight of China. Um, but just as importantly, see, because you think there's something strategic going on here, and I'm not saying there wasn't anything, but just as importantly, they were allowed to do it. You know, they were, nobody was saying, don't go there. And so that policy developed as much because of bureaucratic turf within Washington as it did because China's really important. And we really, you know, Asia is, you know, half the people in the world live in Asia. The economic center of gravity of the world is shifting to Asia. The most important uh, security issues in the world are associated with Asia. You know, I mean, it was the right thing to do, but part of it was done for the wrong reasons. And that's something else you've got to take, you know. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I once had a conversation with a former national security advisor in the middle of a discussion about, you know, some newspaper article talking about a vast, you know, sort of secret plan within the United States government to happen, a kind of, you know, one of these conspiracies, you know, where the U.S. had engineered something. And he said, you know, if there is a choice between something happening in the U.S. government because of a cleverly orchestrated conspiracy or, alternatively, an accident, it almost certainly was always the accident. I'm not saying there aren't parts of the U.S. government that actually get things done in a sort of systematic way. It happens sometimes. But we blunder into as many things as we plan our way into. Um, and, and by the way, I think that's true with most governments around the world. Countries have limited bandwidth, and the planet has lots going on in it. Part of it is, of course, affected by other cultural issues. The United States is the only country on the planet Earth where when something happens, somebody walks into an office and says, this happened, what should we do about it? Okay? In every other country in the world, when something happens, somebody walks into the office and says, this happened, should we do something about it? But the, in the U.S., the, the presumption is that we ought to be involved somehow. We ought to comment. We ought to intervene. It affects us. We have global interests. Now, you know, I think we're in a period of change. I think we, 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 the U.S. is sort of leaning back a little bit. I think we've got domestic issues. I think we've got financial constraints. I think we have exhaustion from Iraq and Afghanistan and for being overly aggressive. Um, but, you know, we've leaned back and... President Obama was elected in reaction to the President Bush doing too much. And what's happened? Have you seen the United States be less engaged in the world? No, people write that kind of stuff. But actually, we've just become differently engaged in the world. We don't send in armies. We send in drones. You know, we don't, we, we don't send in, you know, we, we, we don't uh, violate international uh, uh, laws as frequently as we did, although we certainly continue to view international law as something that, you know, hey, that was kind of an idea we promoted for a while, so we get to do whatever we want. I mean, which is, but that is, that's one of the few things in, in the U.S. government where there is a policy, you know, where there's something deeply ingrained in the veins, which is we get to make up the rules as we go. Um, and, you know, I mean, 
you know, the rest of the world finds that irritating because it's wrong, you know, but, but we do it anyway because we are the most powerful nation on earth. And no matter what happens for the next 50 years, we will continue to be the most powerful nation on earth because we're the only country that is capable of waging a war anywhere on the planet from space, from air, from sea, or from land. Um, and, you know, at some point in the next 30 or 40 or 50 years, China may be able to do that. And at that point, there may be something like a balance. But we're also the biggest economy, the richest economy. We've got a lot of stuff going on for us. We, don't have the, you know, we, have a, we have a very, very big economy, but many fewer people than China does, so we have you know, less burdens in that regard. So for the next 30 or 40 or 50 years, the United States will continue to drive its foreign policy out of a presumption that it can do essentially whatever it wants to do. Um, it's just going to do it in slightly different ways depending on the predisposition of these groups. Um, now, having said that, I think there are other factors that don't get discussed, almost never get discussed, uh, cultural factors that are really important in foreign policy. Some of what I was just talking about imbues them. But, for example, the foreign policy community in the United States, the people, not, not just the people in the government, but the people in think tanks, the people in academia, the, all these people who write about foreign policy. Um, I would argue that the foreign policy community in the United States is woefully uncreative. Um, and that part of the reason is that one of the ways that you sort of catch the brass ring is that you go into the government. But you can't go into the government in a senior post. You can't get approved for it if you've written something outrageous, so you, if you've taken a chance, if you've departed from the norm. Uh, it, you know, it causes you problems in academia, and then when it causes you problems with the Senate, when you have to get confirmed for a job. So there are all these disincentives in the system to push against creativity. Also, there's a hierarchy, a cultural hierarchy. It's a really weird cultural hierarchy where, for the longest time, the people who sort of take precedence in foreign policy and formation in the United States are the people who deal with things that explode. Um, you know, in other words, if you, if you dealt with nuclear policy, you were really important. If you dealt with the Soviet Union back in the day, you were really important in this thing. If you dealt with, I don't know, women's issues, unimportant. Now, <laughs> you know, let's do the math, right? 51% of the planet are women. You know, the systematic oppression of women throughout human history is almost certainly the greatest crime against humanity that has ever been committed. It has gigantic negative consequences economically, socially, politically. It is vastly more important than any nuclear policy or any you know, WMD policy possibly could be. But it's just it's down at the bottom of the hierarchy. There's a regional hierarchy. It used to be the Russians and the Europeans were the top of the hierarchy. So if you were in the Foreign Service or whatever, you know, that's where you wanted to go. That's where the action was. And then down at the bottom was Africa and Latin America. And you would see amazing things. Like people would come out of working in Europe, and they would be given very senior jobs running stuff in Latin America, even though they had no experience there, because they were Europeanists and they could handle anything. But you would never see somebody coming out of a job in Latin America and being given a very senior job dealing with someplace else in the world because, after all, they were, you know, poor schmucks who were doing Latin America, right? And, you know, they weren't up to the, the task. These cultural issues have an issue. The lack of creativity has an issue. And then the fact is that foreign policy deals with a very limited vocabulary. You know, so they sort of stay in their lane. You know, they talk about politics. I love... One of the great oxymorons, I, I don't know if you fully understand the term oxymoron, contradiction in terms, but one of the great oxymorons in my mind is the term political science, okay? Because there is nothing scientific about <laughs> political science, right? Um, and, and yet, you get these people, you get these professors who will say, well, let's do, I'm going to study political risk, and we're going to come up with a formula that will allow you to calculate the political risk of a situation using the following eight variables. Now, you know and I know that political risk is associated with millions and sometimes billions of variables, and to reduce it to eight variables reveals your lack of understanding of the issue more than your understanding of the issue, but you can't write a paper that way. 
You know, so, you know, we end up with people doing political science. We end up with, you know, people looking at these issues that are dominated in this hierarchy and missing the story. So, you know, it's like missing the women. Women have been oppressed by, you know, mankind since the beginning through now. It hasn't been fixed. The average percentage of women's representation in governments around the world is 20%. You know, there are a few outliers. Do you, does anybody know the country with the highest percentage of women in the government? Correct. Rwanda with like 53% or something like that. Um, but else, you know, it's just not c considered as an issue. But if, you know, if you go and ask, you know, we go into uh, not a school as enlightened as this, but let's say we go to Georgetown and, and, we say, and we say to people, what was the biggest foreign policy change of the past 20 years? Undoubtedly, based on the education that they had, people raise their hand and they'll say, the fall of the Soviet Union? Or somebody will say, 9-11, the war on terror? Um, uh, uh, some, you know, some nonsense like that. It's just not, it's, remote, it's idiotic, right? By far the biggest change on the planet Earth, by far, is that in 1990, 12 million people on the planet had cell phones. And today... Six billion, I mean, this is a, a World Bank statistic. Today on the planet, 4.5 billion people have access to a toilet. But six billion people have access to a cell phone, okay? At some point in the next couple of years, everybody on the planet is going to be connected in an artificial man-made system for the first time in the history of the planet. This is a system by which they will learn, by which they will pay bills, by which they will vote, by which they will hear of what's going on on the planet, by which they can touch each other. In the next five years, five billion phones sold will be smartphones, which essentially means computers into the hands. Half of the phones sold in the world are smartphones today, more than half. So this means that essentially we have, in the course of 20 years, gone from nobody knowing what a computer was, nobody having a computer, nobody being connected to one another, to everybody being connected, everybody having a computer, massive amounts of data flowing around the world, and it changes everything. Because since you have a phone in your pocket, I can know where you are at any minute. I, if you, since telemetry is going back and forth between your car and other cars, I can know where your car is at any minute. I can know what you bought. Google, I don't know how many of you have Google accounts, you know, or your Gmail accounts, you know, if you send something on Gmail and you like, you write, dear mom, I bought a couch. You know, your next email has five ads from couch companies on the side of it because <laughs> Google knows that you are in the couch market. Um, you know, the question, big fundamental, fundamental question for society is, do you own that information? Does Google own that information? Or... Does the state own the information? Because when Tahrir Square happened, when Syria happened, when the Boston bombing happened, how did they find the Boston bomber? Car was jacked, hijacked. Guy left his phone in the car. They, f they traced the phone. They found out where the guy is, and they went and got him. So the state's going to say, well, we have access to that information. We're entitled to that information. After the Arab Spring, Chinese government started hearing people talking about the Jasmine Revolution. You know, when, when the word jasmine popped up on Weibo or so forth, people started going after it, right? There's a debate. How much of that is legitimate, you know, nation state looking after their interest? How much of that is not? Well, you know, this, you know, it, between the birth of the, I'm sorry to get off on a sidetrack here, but between the birth of the, 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 the printing press in 1450, it took 250 years for people to start to come to the conclusion that there was something called freedom of the press. But we right now have this revolution, which has happened in 20 years. People are trying to write laws and come up with policies, and we don't have philosophers sitting around coming up with the philosophies that ought to be underpinning those laws right now. Anyway, the point I'm trying to get at is, here's this massive issue. It's you know, going to affect everything that's going on in the world. It's going to change very rapidly with big data and, you know, the massive amounts of, of data, you know, data flows may be more important to the future of economies than capital flows. You have departments of the United States government focused on capital flows. You have three people in the United States government who understand what data flows are. I was talking to an undersecretary of a big department whose job title is Undersecretary for Science and Technology. 
And they told me that they read the White House Directive on Cyber Policy the day it came out. Okay? Which means there was no consultation. Okay? <laughs> so you've got, a, you've got a big problem here. There's another problem, which is that as all these people get empowered and companies get empowered, the big actors in the world aren't nation states. They're private actors. You know, um, Exxon spends more money on global government relations and has a bigger budget than the government of Sweden. You know, Sweden's size is, you know, GDP and Exxon's size of sales are roughly equivalent. But Exxon's active in 200 countries and Sweden is active in 80 countries. Which one is going to win the push and shove regarding global climate treaties? Who has more influence? But there's no department in most governments that deal with the fact that there are now 2,000 companies that are bigger than the smallest 80 countries in terms of economic resources. Another revolution that's taken place that we haven't dealt with yet. Um, so the point is that within the foreign policy culture, there are big blind spots. You know, there are big blind spots. I worked for two years as a managing director for two years of Kissinger Associates. Henry Kissinger is a very interesting character. He's played as influential a role in U.S. foreign policy as anybody else. And if he were sitting here right now and he were in the right mood, he would tell you economics was never his strong suit. Well, how you could be the senior most foreign policy maker in the United States government without really understanding economics is, you know, it's mind-boggling. How is that possible? Most of the interplay between countries and people on the planet is economic. It's not military. It's not diplomatic. Um, and yet we send the wrong people to go off. What caused the Arab Spring? Was it political doctrine? It was food shortages, job shortages. If you talk to the leadership in Jordan and you say, how do we stabilize Jordan so Jordan doesn't go the other way? Their answer is very simple. Six to seven million jobs in the next seven years. That's the answer. How do you create jobs? What do we send there? Diplomats and generals. Instead of people who know how to create jobs. And, you know, this is a, another problem that the United States has in sort of its foreign policy apparatus. And then I'll stop and you can ask some questions or ask me to leave. But, um, <laughs> the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, an, another problem, cultural problem in the United States is we believe in, the, and I got at this earlier, but I want to take it a step further. We believe in the international system, which we helped create in the wake of World War II, to the extent to which it suits us to which is why we created a bunch of international institutions designed to be weak. So, you know, we, 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 won't, we don't, gave a few countries veto powers, um, uh, so nothing would ever happen. We created other kinds of rules that required consensus, so nothing would ever happen. We created mechanisms, you know, that, you know, we have a non-proliferation regime that doesn't have an enforcement mechanism. Well, that's not working very well. Um, you know, we don't want to give enforcement mechanisms because there's this whole view that you cede sovereignty upward. Now, you know, we forget that cities cede sovereignty to states and states cede sovereignty to national governments all the time. Um, and this is a way of ensuring that the people in the city have some kind of representation at the, at the international level. We, if, if we do not have strong international mechanisms, like on climate, for example, then what happens? Nothing. We just crossed the 400 parts per million threshold for CO2 a few weeks ago, which we were warned years ago was a, a dangerous red line in terms of the climate. Why didn't we get there? No strong international mechanisms to get there. And so we protected our sovereignty. We didn't create a strong institution. The only problem is we didn't actually address the problem. We didn't, we didn't actually have a functioning apparatus. That's also a cultural problem. The United States doesn't, you know, think it has to play well within the international system. Uh, it uses it, it and it abuses it. And that is another problem. So when you go and you look at this apparatus and when you read the newspapers, you can read about process and you can hear about policies. But I just hope that you come out of 
your graduate educations and visits to places like Washington with enough of a skeptical eye to realize that things like personality and culture and habit and gaps and bureaucratic glitches drive policy formation as much as anything else. And all of them are secondary to reacting to things that happen in the rest of the world. I, you know, that most of what we do is react to things that happen in the rest of the world that are beyond our control. And that's what's true in other governments. I think lots is going to change in terms of the U.S., and I'm happy to talk about that. I think uh, lots is going to change in terms of who we're dealing with and how we're going to deal with them over the next several years. But, but, but right now, I, I don't want you to have the idea that there is some kind of disciplined, coherent, visionary, thought-out foreign policy mechanism in the United States. Now, maybe because the, maybe the, 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 the fact that this is my view is the reason I was the third choice speaker here. <laughs> Um, however, <laughs> um, you know, there you go. You know, you, you couldn't, the other guys had something else to do. So anyway, um, but I'm happy to answer your questions about anything that has to do with foreign policy or um, any, any other issue. I, I'm going to answer a question you haven't asked. So my real question is, um, so could you please make some comments on U.S. use of uh, smart power and how successful it has been? Because I have, I have read an article on foreign policy by Joseph Nye um, on, like, um, U.S. Uh, in the first term of Obama administration, there's been a cut on the budget of um, uh, U.S. aid. So, um, so he claims that it is a damage to a principal uh, component of smart power, which is the soft power. So I'd like to hear your voice, um, thoughts about it. Thank you. As, but, but, but there's a, an important lesson about political science, by the way, in this idea of smart power, right? Smart power, if you're going to create a term that you're going to own, and Joe Nye created this term, smart power, um, it's a real beaut because it implies that if somebody disagrees with you, they're not smart, you know, it's like the power, the way I want to use power is smart, um, and other forms are, are, are stupid um, or unenlightened. Um, and so, you know, terms like that become very amorphous as people sort of adjust them to their own means. I think specifically, however, really what smart power and soft power means is anything that doesn't explode. You know, in other words, it's, you know, it's just not hard power. It's not the use of force. Um, and, again, the United States doesn't have a committee for the use of smart power or a committee for the use of soft power. It's got a toolbox, just like any other government does, and it uses the items in the toolbox to the extent it can. Um, and one of the items that's been in that toolbox for a while is foreign aid. Now, foreign aid, which, again, it's another one of those interestingly named terms. This is a Cold War era term, and the United States and the Russians both gave out foreign aid, which was essentially paying people to like us and be on our side, right? So you could call it something else other than foreign aid if, if you wanted to. Um, but over time, it also came to serve some really valuable purposes uh, in terms of social and humanitarian objectives. Um, uh, and is therefore of enormous value, right? Because I believe that all countries are part of a global community and have a responsibility to that community. And just as the richest person in a community has a greater responsibility than all the other people to help the community, the richest country has a greater responsibility. And so I think simply you know, providing foreign aid um, uh, ends up elevating the United States and strengthening our relationships elsewhere in the world. Um, but there are a couple of problems with the foreign aid um, uh, situation in the United States right now. One is, as our budgets are constrained, everything's going to get cut back. And this is seen as less immediately beneficial to Americans. And so there is a strong strain, particularly in the Republican Party right now, um, to cut back on foreign aid. Secondly, foreign aid was never that much to begin with. It's 1% of the budget. <coughs> and most of it goes to just a couple of states. Um, so it's, it's actually quite a limited tool. 
Uh, in terms of soft power, much greater tool is trade relations, uh, access to the United States market, um, uh, 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 providing you know certain kinds of technical assistance and collaboration, um, uh, uh, even things like basing troops in countries or or you know uh, buying weapons from countries and other kinds of things have economic benefits that are soft uh, and provide more leverage than 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 uh, uh, than foreign aid does. My guess is that the United States will, despite all the rhetoric, not cut its foreign aid that much because, frankly, there's not that much to cut. It may shrink a little bit. It'll still be there. It won't be um, that uh, influential in most cases because it's so small. Uh, and that actually one of the things that we're going to have to do is to learn how to marshal global resources we're going to have to learn how to use diplomacy better to get multiple nations to contribute. Um, and uh, this is all getting slightly complicated by the fact that one of the ways we did that and leverage it was through international financial institutions, which we dominated for a long time. But the control of those international institutions is going to change. I, I, I would be very surprised if within the next seven or eight years, the head of the IMF was not somebody Chinese. Um, I, I, I'm serious. I think that that's, that's, I mean, it could happen, by the way, in the next couple of months. If Christine Lagarde has legal problems um, uh, th that get worse um, and she has to leave, then you will have had four European heads of the IMF in a row that had to leave early, and they're going to have to look to Asia uh, and the Chinese deputy there is very highly thought of and could easily go on and take it. You have a BRICS bank, which I think almost certainly is going to come and become a big actor there. I mean, Brazil's National Development Bank actually lends more money than the World Bank. Um, so it's giant. So, you know, there, there are a lot of other people, actors out there um, that are going to uh, start to influence the flows of the collective soft power of the world as much or more than the U.S. has in the past, right? So I think that's a, there's a sort of shift of soft power that's going to happen also that's, that's maybe more significant than what happens around our budget. Bring if you can shed some lights on uh, the future of corporate social responsibility and uh, to what degree you think uh, profitability and social responsibility can reconcile uh, within U.S. or international corporations. Okay. Well, I don't, th I don't think I've been controversial enough yet, so <laughs> let me sort of go a little bit further. Corporate social responsibility is bullshit, okay? <laughs> um, this is a term made up by corporations to characterize actions they take in their own self-interest as being something other than that, <laughs> right? But almost all the money spent by corporations in order to exercise social responsibility ends up doing something that they either should have been doing anyway because they were you know, exacting a cost from society um, or because they're buying political favor in order to do something that they shouldn't be doing otherwise. Uh, the percentage of money go that goes from corporate budgets overall to corporate social responsibility, I believe, and double check if I'm wrong about this, but I believe it's 0.01% of uh, total uh, corporate revenues worldwide. So it is a tiny, tiny fraction of this. Now, having said that, corporations do play a role in addressing major social issues, um, but typically for self-interested reasons. You know, Pepsi is doing a lot of good work on water, because most of what Pepsi sells is water, right? And so having clean supplies of water in the world is really important to Pepsi, right? Um, uh, you know, m many of the big agricultural companies in the world have done a lot to increase food production. You know, it's been hugely valuable. The big IT companies have made this IT revolution happen. So corporations do wonderful things for society but they do them based on one principle, and that is serving their owners. 
whether the owner is a state or the owner is a group of shareholders. And corporations should never be expected to act in the interest of society because most corporations in capitalist societies are actually legally prohibited from doing it. The legal obligation of the board of a company is to serve the interests of the shareholders of the company. That's why they exist. Now, a lot, you know, frankly, the theory of markets is that you know, people do things that benefit them, and so you have a lot of people acting to benefit society. You know, there will be a lot of benefits that accrue from this. But it's not going to be because corporations start doing what governments ought to do. Um, and that is a problem with corporate social responsibility. As government budgets shrink, then they say, well, companies should do this. Let's have the Gates Foundation step up and handle the distribution of uh, 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 syringes in Africa. Okay? Well, that's fine. And it's great that the Gates Foundation is donating all of this money. But essentially what you're doing then is taking something that's a social issue and assigning it to a group that has no accountability to the people. Um, and that's a fundamental problem. So it's not that philanthropy is bad. It's just we have to see it for what it is and recognize that there are some issues where it's in the interests of everybody to have mechanisms accountable to everybody deciding how to use assets or how to solve problems. Uh, and there are indeed, you know, I mean, you know, if it was left to the marketplace, old people, people with physical disabilities, would be left beside the road to die. They don't serve a purpose. But as a society, we have reasons that we want to lift them up. Um, you know, people who don't have the ability to learn the way we, you know, you need to in society would get left along the way. Um, uh, and that's why I think, you know, it's very important to have the public-private balance right rather than to watch the private go up and then say, now you have public responsibilities because they won't act in the way that the public will act. Hi, I'm Ms. Rotkoff. Uh, my name is Yu from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm studying public policy management. So you talk about all these um, technological transformation, big data, and the development of SNS. So what do you think that, how, mm, how, do, you feel that, how do you think that transforms, uh, translates into America's um, democracy assistance policy in terms of does it increase, does it implies an increasing emphasis on propping up um, um, social security uh, networks in a lot of countries, including, uh, for example, propping up free gate to, uh, proxies like free gate to, to have people accessing Facebook in China. Um. Okay, well, that's a kind of complicated question. I, you know, I think that you will see the United States actively pursue policies that promote right of access to the Internet, freedom of the Internet, um, uh, 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 protection of, of privacy, and global standards because I think the United States will ultimately see those in our interest because we are already open and we already have uh, those kind of standards and we believe that promoting those standards will promote uh, our interests in terms of democratization, the movement of, towards free markets, um, and um, the, the reduce the likelihood of autocratic states to exist in the world. Um, the problem is that you promote those things most effectively through strong international institutions. And I don't think the United States will embrace strong international institutions. So I think we're in for a period of a lot of lobbying and a lot of trying to form collectives on these issues. And, I, you know, by the way, if you look at the TPP uh, uh, trade negotiations or you look at the emerging TTIP trade negotiations, the transatlantic trade negotiations, Data issues, uh, cyber issues, uh, internet governance issues, privacy issues, they're now rising up. You know, 20 years ago, they were just not on the scale of important priorities. Now they're rising up the scale of priorities. And I think that that's going to happen a lot. And I think, you know, we're coming to a point of real potential conflict in the world 
on several of these fronts. I think there is a potential for conflict on the whole Internet governance issue, and does a state have the right to set separate rules for its own chunk of the Internet? Can it collect taxes? Can it deny access? Uh, and what are the consequences of that in the global marketplace? I think privacy issues are the same. Um, uh, global commerce issues and protections of global commerce and protections of identity and so forth, global liability issues, cyber issues, cyber warfare issues and so forth. There's a, there's a big global agenda of these issues. Uh, and my guess is that you will hear low-level murmuring around them, and then there will be some crisis. And the crisis will be, you know, a big hack will shut down part of an air traffic control system or a bank or a highway. And, and all of a sudden, you're going to have the people in the U.S. Congress and other places standing up going, change the laws, sanction China, do this. Do, you know, and all of a sudden, it's going to reach a point of crisis, and we're going to then try to come up with some sustainable mechanisms rather than going from crisis to crisis. It plays a very uh, important role now, nowadays. So I, I just wonder, because um, um, some advocates by the U.S. Department of the State and uh, its so-called e-diplomacy. So that's called electronic diplomacy. And uh, so I just wonder if you are, can just uh, elaborate on it a little bit. Or so basically like using uh, Facebook, some social network tools, Facebook or Twitter. And so I think that really provides a channel for the government to hear more from the public opinion. Uh, so... Uh, such kind of things can be done in a uh, bottom-up way compared with the traditional top-down. So I just wonder if that's going to be a significant change. I think there will be a sig significant change, but I think that, you know, the difference between the policies that we have and real policies is like the difference between, you know, buying a ticket on an airplane and having an Air Force. Um, in other words... We, you know, the e-diplomacy e policies of the State Department are window dressing. They're, they're little experiments. They're, you know, people are tweeting. And, uh, you know, they're, they're identifying, you know, they're promoting the use of the Internet to support U.S. Um, uh, interests in different parts of the world in the most minor way. The issues that I've just talked about, privacy, cyber, um, internet governance, uh, uh, the implications for conflict, and so forth. There's no centralized mechanism to deal with these, no high-level mechanism to deal with these, no strong international mechanism to deal with these. Um, but there will be, because it's fundamentally changing the world, and it's fundamentally changing what foreign policy is. And that's why, you know, I don't think one should be able to go and get a degree in foreign policy without understanding information technology or without understanding issues like women's rights and the economic implications of that or without understanding things like the revolutions in bioscience. I mean, can, we, we can go and sit there and try to debate how important it is to the world whether China has one, two, or three aircraft carrier battle groups. But if the average person in China... 10 years from now, lives to be 85 years old, that's going to have a much bigger implication on the Chinese economy and Chinese policy and, and so forth. Here's a statistic that I often give in groups in the United States that chills them to the bone. And I say this with all due respect, and please don't take offense to this, but it scares the hell out of them. Okay? 70% of the active pharmacological ingredients in the drugs taken by Americans come from China, okay? 70%. That means the United States is completely dependent on China to deal with disease, okay? Imagine a pandemic, and all of a sudden, we really need a lot of some medicine, and all the active pharmacological ingredient is made in China. Do you think that's a source of potential international tension? When the Chinese government says, well, I think we'll take care of our people first, thanks. You know, 
Yeah. I mean, you know, this is, but you know, if you, you trust me, there's not a lot of discussion about this. I mean, at the Food and Drug Administration here, there are a few people who are very concerned about it. I mean, they're also concerned about it because of product safety issues in China. You know, if you can't get, you know, baby formula, you know, think about being dependent on this flow of drugs. But the, all I'm saying is, all of these issues are what drive global affairs. It's not just the stuff that gets taught in the average political science or international relations classroom. And by the way, I taught IR at, at Columbia at SEPA for 10 years. So, you know, I, I, you know I've been uh, guilty of some of the things that I'm talking about here. I mean, I'm happy to go as long as you want, but I mean, well, I mean. It'll just take up your break time. So okay, we'll take, two, we'll take a couple of questions, but go, go on. Thank you. My name is Shin Yimei, and I am from Illinois Institute of Technology. I am a PhD candidate in polymer chemistry. And uh, now the relationship of BRICS are becoming more friendly, and the influence of BRICS are uh, growing dramatically worldwide. So it depends on this. My question is, what kind of uh, foreign police uh, the United States were used to strengthen the relationship with BRICS, and what kind of a role uh, United States will play uh, between the BRICS, the five countries? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, it, it's an important question, and there's clearly been a move. You know, on November 15, 2008, in the wake of the financial crisis, George W. Bush convened a G20 meeting to deal with that crisis, not a G7 meeting. And since then, there have been a number of G20 meetings convened as a mechanism for dealing with this. And that was partially a recognition of the rise of the BRICS. Um, I think that you have seen the United States try to develop closer policy relations um, with BRIC countries, not so much South Africa because they're kind of an add-on into the thing, but, but, but um, uh, certainly Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And the next tier some of the critical countries. So I, was, I was actually with the Prime Minister of Singapore a couple of weeks ago, and his wife pointed out that they, should, they were called to her the mint countries, which is Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. Um, but, but, you know, the United States has been, I've seen Turkey as absolutely playing a central role in the Middle East. Nigeria is absolutely one of the most important places to U.S. foreign policy right now, particularly given instability in the North and its oil supplies. Indonesia is very significant. Again, you, you want to you uh, uh, look at long-term trends in foreign policy. Um, here's one that nobody really wants to talk about because they're not sure what the implications are. Right now, there are one billion Muslims in the world. Okay, one out of six people. Okay? In 2050, there will be three billion. Okay? Now, that can be a great thing. I mean, I'm, I'm, but it's going to change power relationships in the planet in a pretty fundamental way. Not a lot of discussion going on about that. There are other efforts being made to go and reach out to the BRICS. Vice President Biden was in Brazil. President Rousseff is coming in October and we'll have a state dinner. The United States said we would recognize, you know, we would support India's permanent membership of a seat in the UN Security Council. We will at some point say the same thing about Brazil as we have also about Germany and Japan. But our policy towards the BRICS is going to be divide and conquer. Okay, it's, gonna, it's not going to be like, oh, that's great. Let's have another group of really powerful countries that can counterbalance us which is kind of how Russia views the BRICS as a useful tool and how some of the other countries within the BRICS have viewed the BRICS as a useful tool. The United States is going to be, well, India is a useful counterbalance against China. You know, Turkey is a useful counterbalance against this, the, this part of the region. We'd like to keep Russia out of almost everything because they're a problem, um, and, 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 and so forth. I mean, even, even with Brazil... We're, we're a little wary of embracing them too much because we see them as having big independent influence in South America. I think that's wrong, by the way. I think we should embrace them. I think it was excellent that the World Trade Organization put a Brazilian in the top job um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I think the rise of the BRICS is 
just, you know, this is the majority of humanity, gets better representation from countries that look like the majority of humanity than they do from countries that don't. So I think it's a good trend, but I, I think the United States is going to view it in a balance of power way uh, for the foreseeable future. Hi, my name is Ying. I'm the PhD student in public policy and political economy from the University of Texas at Dallas. After so many questions about foreign policy, I have a question about you. I found out you have a very impressive experience. You are a CEO, you are the scholar, and also you write a lot of books and uh, papers, uh, newspapers and magazines. So how do you balance your research and your work? How do you keep <laughs> thinking, researching, and writing when you are so busy about your business all day? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, I think you're making an assumption, which is that I actually am able to balance them. Um, uh, uh, secondly, uh, doing without sleep helps. Um, uh, but you know, I think that you know, there's a following traditional career paths is overrated. Um, following what's interesting to you in the way that you want to do it is, you know, the only thing that you can reconcile yourself to at the end of your life. And I'll say something now that none of you expect me to say, I guarantee you. I spent the first seven years of my career directing theater. Um, okay, I, I, I spent the first seven years of my career uh, doing television shows. Um, I spent the first seven years doing something completely different and I'm glad I did it for the first seven years, and I learned a lot in doing it and moved on to the other things. I've just gotten to a point in my life now where I'm, I can, I'm CEO of two different companies, um, you know, a magazine and a consulting company, and I'm a visiting scholar at Carnegie where I get to run a program and I get to write stuff. And I, you know, basically, I, I, and mostly I'm father of two daughters. That's my main job. Um, uh, at least in their view, that's my main job. Uh, and... You know, I'm just, I've just gotten lucky, but partially it's because I, I've been reluctant to sort of follow rules that, you know, the sort of there is one path to get to where you're going kind of thing. I'd rather eat at a few different restaurants than just one. Okay, what? Last I'm Jidal from the studying IR at Joseph Cobell School at University of Denver, and thank you for your honest and impressive speech. My question is more general, like, just like your comments about the corporate social responsibility, do you think, like, the U.S. foreign policy, like, promoting human rights, promoting those principles, American values, is it kind of more like an, uh, one, of, uh, one of the core interests of U.S. foreign policy or just an uh, instrument that used to justify, like, the U.S., like, use of power? Well, I think that the most important thing, and to, to answer that question, the most important thing to take away from this kind of a discussion is there is no black and white answer. It is possible to cast things in as many ways as that you want, and that the nuanced mind will see the spectrum of realities. And the spectrum of realities with the United States extends from the fact that this is a country that was founded on slavery and genocide, okay? That is the only country on earth to use nuclear weapons against another country that firebombed Dresden in Germany where 800,000 people died in flames um, uh, and that has committed, you know, even recently, viol serially violated international laws that we created and the sovereignty of other nations as it suited us, okay? And on the other hand in, of the spectrum, no country in modern history has done more to promote the development of international law, the development of international institutions. In the wake of World War II, we did not conquer those countries, which history would have concluded that we would have. We rebuilt those countries out of our pockets. Now, you know, again, it was self-interested. The Marshall Plan wasn't because we love Europeans. It's because we wanted a strong Europe between us and Russia. But we could have made Europe 
American. We could have made Japan American. We didn't do that. And throughout the course of the past 50 or 60 or 70 years, for every instance of secret war in Cambodia, secret war in Laos, a wink and a nod look uh, to President Suharto to go into East Timor and commit genocide, um, uh, upsetting the government of Pinochet and uh, 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 upsetting the government of uh, Allende in, in Chile, for every one of those things, there is USAID programs, there is the Peace Corps, there is rebuilding programs, um, and there is a real commitment, a real commitment, and a real belief among most American political leaders of both parties that it is in our interests for people to be democratic, for people to be free, and for markets uh, that are unimpeded to thrive. And that contradiction is America. It's not one or the other. It's both of those things together. And every country I can think, I cannot think of a great power in the world that does not have blood on its hands, that has not committed great atrocities, that has not, I mean, and, and, you, and you name a major power, name a small power, it's happened in all of them. The path to power is ugly. The real question is what happens when a country has power and how it uses it. And I think that over the course of the past 50 years, on balance, the record of the United States is something that most Americans are justifiably proud of. Anyway, thanks very much. I really appreciate it.